Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to the session today. This session only appeared in the catalog about 19 hours ago, uh, because obviously you may be aware some of the new releases in Adam's keynote yesterday uh, prevented this from being brought forward. But we're going to cover some of those announcements today and how they fit into executing a large-scale migration. So this is session ENT230. Uh, my name is Jonathan Allen. I'm a director in the enterprise strategy team. I've uh, been with AWS about four years. Before joining Amazon, I actually was a customer for 17 years, a, a divisional CTO for a very large bank who moved uh, all in to AWS and had the privilege of those lessons learned. And over the last four years, I've actually worked with 650 different customers who have all been migrating around the planet. Uh, a small handful of those have been startups who have been uh, obviously building new, but the majority of those have been migrating. And what we're aiming to bring to you today in this session is lessons learned. That is the key principle for today. I'm going to let my colleagues introduce themselves when they come up onto the stage. We want you to avoid the stall. And looking up the word stalling, there's obviously 631 other words for stalling. And we don't want you to encounter any of them. So throughout this deck, we've really put as many lessons learned from the thousands of enterprises that have migrated. So with that in effect, what I want to do is actually go straight into lessons learned and actually list them for you. And we're going to do this in every stage of the presentation. And then when we've listed them, we're actually going to dive deep. So as I go through these, this is your chance, if you would like, to take a picture of this slide. Of course, this entire presentation will be available for you to download afterwards and have a look at. And it'll also be available online. But right now, really want to go through those lessons. I'm going to go through these reasonably quickly, give you a chance to take a picture, and then I'm going to dive deep into them. So understanding and agreeing on your compelling why, particularly as a leadership team, super important. Others have absolutely gone before. You've got this. It could sometimes seem a little overwhelming, but don't worry. Be aware of analysis paralysis. In this visioning phase, very often you can procrastinate because you don't know enough. So you can get stuck in this analysis paralysis. And we're going to give you some top tips on how to not get stuck in that phase. Really importantly, you've got to provide a path for upskilling and reskilling, not just training. I'm going to give you some top tips on the best ways I've seen both myself and from working with customers to do that. We're going to talk about cloud centers of excellence. And we're going to cover patterns and anti-patterns for CCOE. Momentum and blockage removal is incredibly important. Single-threaded senior leader can have great efficacy. Absolutely, Amazon Web Services can help. And we're going to go into a lot of detail on those different phases. And the biggest lesson learned from the visioning phase is cross-business sponsorship is absolutely crucial. So this is your chance to take a picture of these. And then I'm going to break them down <coughs> in this first phase. So understanding and agreeing your compelling why. When I speak to leadership teams and they ask me, what is, what is the biggest lesson learned? I often say to them, as a leadership team, understand your one or two or three reasons why you are doing this, whatever it may be. Now, when I was a customer going on the journey, actually, stability and agility were the two primary reasons why I moved to the cloud. But for every single customer around the planet, I find they are vastly different. There are so many benefits that really you've got to zero in on the one or two that are going to have the best impact for you and make sure that the leadership team absolutely are bought into that. Otherwise, you can stall later on. So really understand your compelling why. And then the other thing I found when I was going through the journey is it can actually feel a little bit overwhelming. It's like, where do I start? What do I do? And the, and the thing to really remember here is so many others have gone before, whether it's Capital One, whether it's Nordstrom, whether it's BP, whether it's Enel, whether it's Coca-Cola, 
So many have gone before, and there's now so many lessons learned that we've packed as many as we can into this presentation. So you've got this. One of the most compelling things that people are obviously looking forward to benefit from is cost savings. And the reason I love the Live Nation example, and we've put it here up for you today, is when you look at the total cost savings here of 58% for Live Nation, they achieved 18% immediately, and then really importantly, the majority of their cost savings were post-optimization. And the reason for that was when I was running compute and storage on premises, I very often over-provisioned for the expected worst case peak. And you live with that. So, so many things are over-provisioned on on-premises that this is very often when you leverage, when you move, all of the cost saving comes from this optimization phase. But when you look overall, and this is a report from IDC that's available there. There's actually a link in this presentation that will be available. 31% cost savings over comparable infrastructure. 62% more efficient IT folks, able to focus on really customer-facing value add rather than on repetitive maintenance or replacement tasks in your on-premises data center. A 75% increase in agility, that is huge. Now, I talked about this analysis paralysis phase to help you really understand particularly for things like total cost of ownership, how are you going to prove that business case, uh, you can absolutely use Migration Evaluator here. This is a tool that you can absolutely configure with multiple systems that you've got on premises to bring back the information you've got to generate and help you with your business case. If you don't want to deploy the tooling, we can also work with spreadsheets or information repositories you've got to hand. The cool thing about Migration, Evalu Migration Evaluator is the deliverables. You get a directional business case. This is incredibly important to link back to the compelling why if your primary reason is cost. And new is a quick insights version of this to get even faster, high-level results. One of the most important um, elements to get right in the visioning phase is actually what we call the Migration Readiness Assessment, the MRA. Now, I've done this with a large number of customers. And what this provides is asking 60 objective questions. These are not designed to provoke a uh, subjective response. They're there to provide objectivity to how ready are you to migrate. Have you got playbooks? Have you got the security organization fully on board? Have you got a center of excellence aligned? And if not, the migration readiness assessment, which can be done virtually or in person now, will provide that to you and an objective scoring. This allows the leadership team to really focus on where have I got to actually focus my key activities to improve? Where are we not quite green yet? Rather than guessing, this provides that objective scoring for you in that process. Next up, Cloud Centers of Excellence. Now, the reason I'm going to dwell on this is there are a lot of lessons learned here. I think the first one to lean into is some people don't like this term, Cloud Center of Excellence. And I think that's completely understandable. We don't want cloud skills just to be focused in a single team. We want cloud skills everywhere. That said, bringing together a dedicated team of skilled individuals who can act as a fulcrum to help get going for change is incredibly impactful. And these best teams are where you have dedicated resources with a cross-section of technical skills. When I was doing this as a customer, the way I would look at this is if this team can't act autonomously because they're missing a skill or missing an element, say they're missing a network engineer, then give them one. Let's put one in that team. This team needs to be as autonomous as possible. We want this team to deliver results as rapidly as possible. That said, there are absolutely some patterns and anti-patterns for cloud centers of excellence. 
This is an ephemeral team. It's going to change. It's not an immutable construct. This team's got to understand the new cloud patterns. And very often, you're bringing together engineers, developers, who have for many years developed and built on on-premises. And in their mind, they're bringing the on-premises patterns. So there's a change curve they've got to go through technically. And I'm going to come on to actually that change curve and some of the top lessons learned there. Using legacy on-premises design patterns is absolutely an anti-pattern. Your AWS solutions architect, AWS ProServe, or authorized partner is absolutely your best friend here in this regard. In fact, when I was building my Cloud Center of Excellence team, I had the privilege of bringing a partner in that did pair programming with everybody in my first Cloud Center of Excellence team. Pair programming this concept where you have one machine, two mice, two keyboards, two screens, and together they'll develop the cloud formation code, which is actually going to bring online and substantiate the AWS components. That was like putting rocket fuel into the team to help them understand the new cloud patterns. And their role should be absolutely to work to empower other teams, not to become a bottleneck. And we typically see this at around six to nine months when people have been on a cloud journey. If this team is trying to put in place all of the patterns for the whole organization, then it's going to become a bottleneck. What do you do about that? You can actually borrow a concept from nature. You can split the team into two. Bring more folks in who want to go through that training, learning how to do cloud. Very often, people go, well, what's the end state? And the best end state I've seen and used is when, in effect, you end up with a cloud ops team. And they're responsible for some very specific things. The overall preventative and detective guardrails, having a common Amazon machine image, making sure that identity access management organizations are running in congruence with the security organization. That is how we really see it working best. And as a tenant, they're working to empower all the teams to use and develop on cloud. So again, they're establishing the essential patterns first. Very often, Cloud Center of Excellence teams in the early days are working with maybe only 15 to 16 building blocks from AWS. They're the ones where they need to establish the first patterns, not worrying about all of the tools available to you, all of the building blocks in AWS. What's the first ones I need to understand to get going? Don't try and boil the ocean. And finally, we're looking for technically Self-sufficient, dedicated resources. Side of the desk resourcing does not work, in my experience, for these teams, especially in a larger enterprise. And that's really hard, by the way, sometimes to take some of your most talented folks and place them into a cloud center of excellence team. Because your most talented folks are very often working on the hardest problems for your business, which is why understanding your compelling why at the start and ensuring the executive team are highly supportive of why we're doing this is so important and we put that actually as the very first lesson learned on this journey. The other thing that's incredibly important in the vision stage is to think about scaling the reskilling. Now, going into this topic is another hour-long breakout in its own right, so I wanted to provide you here in this presentation two QR codes of both the blog and a further video I've done on this topic <coughs> from uh, 2019 reInvent. And the title of, that, of the talk here is actually how to go from zero to hundreds of certified engineers. So when you look at some of the customers like Capital One, National Australia Bank, Verizon, they've actually achieved 10% and now much more of their entire technical staff holding one of the AWS certifications. Hugely important tipping point to get to. And in this blog, you'll find that there's 12 steps I've seen work incredibly well to scale that. And again, that's also how you break out from this Cloud Center of Excellence team becoming a bottleneck, which we do not want. We want to scale beyond that bottleneck. Really important at the start. The other thing um, which I see as absolutely crucial is having a single-threaded leader. What is a single-threaded leader? It's actually an Amazonian concept. This is somebody who wakes up every day, and their role 
is to help move this thing forward. It's what they do. And typically, we see this being a direct report of the CIO who is there to help drive this forward. Very often, I've seen the CIOs actually take this mantle on themselves to push it forward. So this is incredibly important. And the reason this is important is I typically find absolutely in my own journey and the customers I work with, you get blockers come out. All sorts of blockers from resource constraints to which partners are we going to use, to which tooling are we going to leverage, to uh, third party contract review, to uh, risk mitigation. And having somebody senior who can help remove these blockers, especially in the first three to six months, is absolutely essential in your migrations and setting the patterns to move forward. What we'll also talk about later on, my colleague Mary will cover it, is talking about how to use what we call the seven R's of migration. Having them involved, crucial. And the last lesson learned here is AWS can help, absolutely help. And for that, we have the Migration Acceleration Program. And I'd now like to hand over to my colleague, Mary. Thank you. All right, now I can talk without a mask. All right, good morning, all. Uh, so as, as Jonathan said, we are introducing her as we come on. So I'm Mary McDaniel. I'm part of our professional services team, and I specialize in migrations globally. I've been with AWS uh, almost six years, and I joined to actually focus on migrations. That's all I've done. Uh, like Jonathan, I've worked with hundreds of customers and also supporting partners in how we help customers do this migration journey. Uh, my background before AWS had been in software development. I ran commercial software teams and financial services, so definitely understand the criticality of moving applications and, and also business critical workloads that really are important to your industry and your customers. So as we talked about we can help, uh, we have a capability today available to you called AWS Prescriptive Guidance. It's We've taken our best practices of working with thousands of customers. We've put this into guides, strategies, and patterns to help you. You can go look at those today. You can grab them. They're there to help you get started on many of the things we're going to talk about today. You'll find things that will help you in that uh, get started today. So I'm going to talk about lessons learned in what we call the assess and mobilize phase. If you think about when you start a migration, you've got to get that assessment of what we're going to move and how we're going to move it, and then you've got to get a foundation that's ready to go. So this is where we'll focus here. So really what I think is important to think about is your portfolio. Um, and it's not a once and done exercise. You're going to need to look at that portfolio and then make some decisions about the R's, which I'm going to talk about later. Your priorities will change. Expect it. You may lay out an approach, the business changes. Look at what COVID did to all of us in the last two years. So expect change uh, and just plan for it. It's going to happen. Full application team inclusion from the start is critical. This can't be just an IT by themselves project. It's got to have your application teams and your business owners in engaged. Pick your tooling early. Uh, do not underestimate security approvals. I've seen many a migration get delayed because it takes too long to get discovery tooling in. So think about that early in the assess phase. What tooling do you think you'll need? We'll talk a bit about Control Tower and how that can really have a significant role in helping your migration and your ongoing operations. Shortlist your migration partners. I'll share a slide in a bit about some migration partners you can consider, but you definitely want to figure out who you want to help you in this journey. Um, established management and governance, as Jonathan talked about, that single-threaded leader, the CCOE, get that established early on. Um, and also think about the operation. The way you operate today is not how you're going to operate in the future. And I think the biggest lesson learned we find is understanding and allowing for dependencies. And these just aren't application dependencies, but business dependencies, uh, cyclical markets, whatever may impact your industry, you've got to be prepared for those dependencies and how do they factor into your plans. So let's dive a little deeper. So I talked about earlier portfolio assessment will be continual. We have this journey of seven R's. Um, it's out there, everyone talks about it, Gardner, everyone. But we find this is a good way to think about your portfolio and determine how you're going to deal with the various applications and servers and data that you have that needs to be moved to the cloud or moved somewhere else. 
And I'll go deeper into each of these. Also, one thing to think about is, and this is average, your mileage may vary, but many of our customers look at about 50% can be moved rapidly, and the other 50% has more business value. So there's, there's things you're going to want to retire, just get rid of those. But there's going to be some part of your business that you really want to focus on, replatform and refactor, because that is essential to your growth that differentiates you in the marketplace. And that's really where you, where you want to put your investment in time and get the other workloads moved quickly and, and out of the data center. So planning, planning's hard. <laughs> it really is. Um, I don't think anyone here probably has a CMDB they love. They probably don't have an inventory of everything in their data center. So really thinking about all those sources of data and tribal knowledge is critical. As Jonathan talked about, you want to bring the team along with you. That tribal knowledge is really important to help you plan the migration. The other thing that's a challenge, right, some of these apps are old and the people who know about them are no longer around or they're close to retirement. So really, you know, getting that information, all the sources you can is really critical to plan it. You'll never get all of it. You just have to get the best and make some decisions as you go. But there again, that's really critical to think about where you're going to get all that information. Also, one thing to note, you know, we talk about the level of effort. You know, retire, retain, those are easy. As you get up to refactor, those are harder. And those also get factored into your decisions of migration. How much time do you want to spend? And what's the compelling event? If it's get out fast, then you're probably going to do more that takes less effort. If you have a longer runway, then you may take a little different approach. But there again, it really depends upon your compelling why. So we look at a structured approach. And we've worked on this, you know, we've been doing migrations 10, 15 years, I don't know. Uh, but we really looked at an approach where, you know, you want to do an assessment, which really thinks about discovering assessment. So as we talk about understanding your, your TCO, understanding your readiness, those lay the foundations that then get into mobilize. Mobilize starts to build some momentum. You get started with, what's the operating model? Let's move some workloads. Let's get started. Those things there build that foundation and get you some experience. So when you get to the other side, you can scale and you can accelerate and go faster. And there again, that's, that's really critical to this foundation. And so we think this structure approach works well for most of our customers. As Jonathan talked about, you're not going to start with a thousand of cloud experts to start. So scale as you go. You don't need a team of 500 to start a migration. You probably need a team of 10 to 12. You need that CCOE. You need your experts. You need your uh, application owners to get started. And then you scale the team. And as Jonathan talked about, you split the team. If you look at the bottom for the cloud platform engineering, you know, that one team of CCOE now splits maybe into two. You now have a business office, and that team then splits to three. So you continually take those experts and split. Um, you know, take a playbook from Agile, right? You have a team that really forms well. You don't want to mess up that form, but if you could take that team and split it into two with some people that aren't as skilled, now you've got two strong teams. And if you do that again, it continues to grow. So think about scaling your team as you go and not starting with the end number, because that's just not feasible to get to in a reasonable time frame with the right skills. So I will tell you, friends don't let friends build landing zones. Uh, you know, as tempting as it may be to create your own landing zone with your own automation and all the scripts and tools that are out there, it, it's, it's tempting. Uh, but with Control Tower now, we provide a service that lets you create that landing zone you need with all the security and controls. The good news, it's a service. So as we add new capabilities, you get to take advantage of those new capabilities. So it helps you kind of reduce some of that technical debt that could happen if you've built your own landing zone with your own scripts. Some people are already there. I totally get that. But if you have an opportunity to start anew, our recommendation is really leverage Control Tower to really help you with that landing zone. And the really cool thing, I think, is really important, you know, coming in my background of financial services is the governance you get because you now can start to have different operating units. You can segregate against production workloads, non-prod, what data you want to protect because it's very sensitive. You can think about data sovereignty and things like that. So this really helps you get that governance in place as you start so you don't really have to build as you go. There again, take our expertise. We've been at this for a few years and we've learned and Control Towers continue to enhance based on our customers' needs. So a great opportunity for you to scale uh, early. 
I said earlier, the way you operate today will not be the same. You've got many choices to operate. Uh, you can do it yourself. That's totally fine. You know, you have the team, you have the capabilities, you may manage your, your infrastructure today. You can go to our AWS managed service where we manage the infrastructure, you manage the apps. So you can differentiate what makes your business special in the applications, maybe not managing the infrastructure. Also, if you're coming from a world where someone manages the infrastructure for you, this is an opportunity maybe to leverage uh, AMS. Or you can use a partner. Many of our customers um, work with, uh, you know, partners manage all that. So you can continue to do that as well. And when you talk to partners, you know, they're available to do that. And, and we have 100 plus MSPs that can do that for you. So it's definitely an option to think about as you operate. But you also need to think about reporting, you know, patch management. All those things are different, which helps you get also another level of agility uh, as we, and potentially some cost savings along the way. Partners are key to transform. And I, I want to say this is a list, not complete, but is a list of our migration certified competency partners. Not everyone gets on this list. We do require partners who specialize in migration to be certified with us, and this is some of those. You can go to our, our website and find a whole list of those. Many of those are here today if you're interested in talking about a migration. But they certainly can come and help you uh, with this migration as well uh, and take whatever lead you need them to do. Some of them specialize in certain workloads. Some look at the whole migration. So there again, partners are really key to your success in helping you do this. Um, if you think about it, right, you want to build a team that's going to be able to run and quickly in the cloud, take advantage of the cloud. You don't necessarily need to build a team that has a migration competency. So there again, partners can really help you in that avenue. We talked about application dependency. You know, this chart just kind of shows the, the craziness of how apps all talk to each other. Uh, I see many customers when we do this, sometimes there's one big blob and it connects to everything. And you have to start breaking out those of those competencies. Later on, we'll talk about mainframes and monoliths. And sometimes when you do a dependency, when those are involved, it's complex. And so the dependency mapping is really important from the apps. And I also said earlier from your business, what are the dependencies around the business you need to think about? So let's think about migrate and modernize. So we've got the foundations. We're now ready to, to really start moving workloads at, at speed. I think one thing is interesting, I hear customers today, um, having been a software developer myself, you know, I don't want to do it twice. I want to, I want to move it and I want to rewrite it and modernize and all those good things and, and get it quick and get it over. We all know that takes longer. It is, it is an interesting approach. It does take longer. But if you think about the rehost and optimize, it's really powerful that you can move workloads quickly. You can then optimize very quickly as they get over there to get those cost savings. As we talked about, things could be over-provisioned. You got a chance to now right-size. That also lets you get some things out of the way, start to see some savings that potentially could help fund some of the modernization efforts that you need to do on some of those business-critical work apps. So don't, don't minimize the rehost. Really look at that as a really powerful combo with optimize. You don't have to reorg the organization to do this. You can go where you are today. Just think about how people work. How do you be smart? But it doesn't require a whole organizational change to do this. Deep dive on the options available to you in each R. You know, we'll talk a bit about those. Don't look at them all. Don't say, ah, I don't want to use that R. I don't think I'll ever use that. Just look at it. Look at your business. Drive your portfolio assessment and planning based on business value and what you want to do with those apps. So definitely leverage all of those. Sure. Um, Parkinson's law. Many of you are probably in the software development space, maybe. You know the law, right? Work fills the time allocated. And so if you make the migration too long, I've got five years to move, you will fill that time. So be really smart about, you know, what are your priorities? What is the timeline? Be aggressive but reasonable, but don't, don't, don't let time, you know, get away with you because it will take, it, you know, people will... It's not as critical. I've seen many organizations say, I've got three years to move. We get to about 18 months, and everybody freaks out. Oh my God, we got 18 months left. We start running really, really fast. So, you know, just, just, be, just be aware of that and look at your team as you're migrating. Wave planning execution should be iterative. You may lay out a wave plan. We'll talk about that in a moment. But that may not be the final wave plan. It may continue to evolve as you go. Just be prepared and work with that. It's, it's totally fine, and it's the way most customers work. 
We talked about map acceleration. It can definitely smooth the way with tools, investments to help you in the migration. As we talked about earlier, momentum and blockage. Having that single-threaded leader that is removing blockers, keeping the momentum going, is really critical um, to keeping on, on your schedule and seeing the benefits that you want. Don't forget all the data. There's more than apps. I talk a lot about apps. You've got databases, you've got a lot, you know, net apps, things like that. You've got all kinds of file storage that's sitting out there. Your SharePoint, things like that have to be moved. So don't forget about the data. It's definitely important. And clean up as you go. Don't say I'm gonna migrate and I'm gonna come back and clean up. Kind of clean as you go. As I talked about the rehost and optimize, right? If I do a bunch of rehosting, then plan a, a wave, a sprint wave right after that that does some cleanup behind you to start to get the clean up those resources and also shut down what's in the data center. So many times, you know, data center shutdown tends to be a thing on its own. Kind of if you can do it as you go, that will help you kind of start to, there again, see those savings and, and not wait till the end for that activity. And as I said, I've talked about this many, many times, I'm afraid, but you know, the post-migration cost optimization is just the biggest lesson learned. I see too many customers who feel like they've moved and they, they're not seeing the benefits they expected, and they haven't really looked at the optimization. So make sure you're optimizing as you go. So let's talk about the R's. First is relocate. Kind of what you say, right? Pick it up, move it somewhere else. Um, AWS has a capability, VMware Cloud on AWS, that's globally available that lets you take what you know today and move it to the cloud. There again, what's your why, that compelling event, if you need to move quickly, this is a great option, uh, especially if you don't want to change what your people do, you don't want to change the apps and how they operate, this is a way to get into the cloud and get capabilities. It's the same VMware that you know, just running in AWS. You can then have your on-prem vCenter connect over into the VMware cloud on AWS. You're, you can use the tools of Power CLI and all that is available to you. And then once you're moved over, you have access then to all the AWS CLI SDK. So you can move those apps and infrastructure into VMware and then start to access all the other AWS native features. And over time, you may decide that that then gets moved to AWS native or you leave it as it is. It really depends upon your operating model. All those choices are available to you. This is a quick way to make that happen and be able to leverage you know, what your team knows and does today and be able to get the cloud and access other cloud services. There's many options to migrate based on your business. You know, is it, I can take downtime, no downtime, minimal, all those options are available to your teams to decide how you want to migrate. And global infrastructure, right now VMware on AWS is available in 18 regions. So it's available most everywhere you may need. Um, we continue to expand, often check, you know, our VMware team as to where new regions have come up. And this session was yesterday, but it's on recording. There is a session ENT311 that's available in recordings that will tell you more and go much deeper in detail than I did on VMware. Uh, that's available to you. So rehost. Uh, many call it lift and shift. So with rehost, we have a tool. Uh, AWS Migration Service, MGN. Some of you may know it as Cloud Endure. We rebranded it um, this past year, but it's our lift and shift solution um, that lets you do block level replication of your applications and databases into AWS. Highly automated, it lets you start and do this rehost rapidly. It also then, when you're ready to cut over, you can do the cut over. So it really provides a quick way uh, to automate that rehost process. Uh, if you want more, there's a QR code there, more about the, to the wiki with our uh, details about the service. So how does it work? Uh, this is a high level architecture diagram. I'm not an MGN expert, but I will do my best to give a high level. Um, you know, on the left is your source environment. You then install the MGN uh, client, and then you, it will start the, it will um, create the new instances in AWS, and it begins a replication. There's no downtime required. It doesn't impact performance. It's there running in the background to help you as you start to replicate. There again, it automates this rehost process for you. When you're ready to cut over, then you can stop the replication and then you can begin to test. So it's very straightforward. 
wide platform support. So many platforms. Um, I won't, you know, look at our documentation to see all the supported versions. It does change regularly, but there again, it offers many, many platforms. Also, you know, VMware, um, other, pla other cloud providers as well. And from ProServe, ProServe has added a capability called Cloud Endure Migration Factory. And what this does is put automation from your wave plants. So while, while, while MGM is focused on moving particular uh, block copies, what CEMF does, it let you take your wave plan, put, the, put the, the list of all the apps you plan and servers you move in that wave, and then it will automate that for you. It will show you what failed, what needs to be restarted, and it will automate that for you, getting you to your target system. Uh, it's available to uh, ProServe to use and our partners as well to help you automate more of the MGN capability. Uh, there is a session tomorrow if you want to know more. It's actually a fairly deep hands-on workshop uh, where uh, the team will show you how to use uh, Cloud Endure Migration Factory. You can see more about MGN as well, uh, but definitely a nice hands-on workshop uh, tomorrow, uh, session ENT301. Replatforming. So this is, you know, an option, an opportunity. Um, you'll have some customers, you know, we have this lift, you know, lift, tweak, and shift, if you will. But replatforming is kind of one of those options where you can actually, <coughs> excuse me, start to reduce some of that technical debt. One of the simple ways to replatform is to stand up new uh, machine images. Um, using automation, Puppet Chef, whatever automation tool you prefer, to actually then start to build new infrastructure and then move those apps into a new um, machine image. Let's you reduce technical debt. If you have old OSs, you can actually then upgrade that OS, test the app to see if that OS is working. Uh, lots of options to help you remove some technical debt uh, as part of the replatforming. And you can take it a step further by actually looking at putting code pipelines in. So kind of many customers I work with who look at this replatform, they take this opportunity they have to replatform to start to automate that, to take the source, build their test environments, deploy it, add the monitoring. So they're getting some additional agility and cost savings and operability increases by actually starting to automate the pipeline. So it takes that replatforming one step further and lets you get more opportunity to um, create more efficiencies in what you do. Another part of replatform that a lot of customers take on is the databases. You know, this is an opportunity when you look at your licensed databases to be able to move to open source. Also the ability to maybe move to purpose-driven databases. So instead of having kind of a pseudo data warehouse sitting in a relational database, this is an opportunity to maybe take that data, move it into Redshift, and now get a real data warehouse along the way. So definitely this is a great opportunity to look at using migration service and other capabilities to get off your licensed databases to various open source or purpose-driven databases. You can also use our Snowball Edge to move the data. If it's large amounts of data, if you don't want to use the data sync, you have the ability to do the snowballs to move the data. To date, 450,000 databases have been migrated using our database migration service. That number continues to grow, but lots of customers are taking advantage of how to move their databases through a replatforming to AWS. So what have we learned about databases? This is really a big area to think about. Um, it is possible to move off licensed databases. It really is possible. It takes some time, but it can be done. Get the code out of databases, right? Store procedures are probably the, the thing we all kind of hate the most that's kind of come around with us. But you know, if you have the opportunity to replatform, can you get those store procedures out and start to really take advantage of the database and create more microservice-based architectures around that? Database migrations is not a one-size-fits-all. You really have to decide what your business What's the database? Some databases have to stay in a licensed database, maybe because it's from a third party software product that you have to stay there. Uh, there again, you just have to kind of determine a strategy, very much like your application strategy. What's your database replatforming strategy? Lots of dry runs. Data is critical. Every business runs off data. So make sure you're, you're doing lots of dry runs on your migration. Measure performance, and then find the right partner again. Biggest lesson learned, 
look at purpose-built databases. There's so many options on databases today. If you can take a step back and can you take advantage, it's an opportunity to scale your business, add more agility, but also maybe reduce cost. I won't drain through this. QR codes are available to the sources and targets for our database migration service of what you can move. And then with their schema conversion tool, this helps you get those schemas from the licensed database into an open source. So here, um, it deals with database schemas, data warehouse schemas, a variety, and lets you optimize those as you move them from your source into your target database. And moving vast amounts of data, the whole Snow family, right, of your file systems that have to get moved. So there's Snow Cone, there's Snowball, there's Snowmobile, Data Sync, lots of options to get your data moved over to your source environment, to your, out, to your file environment. So one customer that's taking advantage of this database work is Samsung. So 1.1 billion users across three continents have gone from Oracle to Amazon Aurora. And I thought was interesting, the quote is, the scalability has been the best benefit. Well, Cost was something they focused on. Scalability was the benefit they hadn't anticipated, which is really huge for them. So there again, you know, there's a lot of advantage to thinking about what you can do with your databases. Repurchase, I'll just take a moment on this. Sometimes the best thing to do is repurchase an application. Um, you may have old uh, software as a service, COT systems, whatever. There could be a better cloud native system, so sometimes repurchase is option. One place to think about that is with um, using our AWS Marketplace. Uh, uh, lots of those ISV services are out there. Don't rebuild what you can probably purchase. There again, you get a supported product that helps you also think about your business agility. Next, we're gonna take a moment to talk about refactoring. Um, and I'm gonna have Steve come up and talk about some new things with Monolith, and then I'm gonna, uh, with Mainframe, I'm gonna talk a bit about the Monolith. But you know, refactoring is a big component, and with some of our announcements, we have some cool things to tell you about. Steve. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Hi, good morning, my name is Steve Stewart. I'm the worldwide lead for Mainframe Transformation, kind of in charge of the go-to-market, everything around Mainframe. Very excited about the announcements that we had. Um, around mainframe uh, yesterday. Um, I, I feel I've been in the business for longer than I like to state, you know, uh, kind of give you an idea. I was, you know, we've been moving alternative compute models for years. I mean, back in the 90s when doing Y2K projects, you know, mainframes and LPARs are very expensive to buy, and we leveraged SCO, you know, SCO Unix and Microfocus to actually offload some of that work to do Y2K work. So customers have been actually looking at how to leverage alternative compute models for many, many years. Uh, the announcement yesterday, I think, is really, really historic from my perspective, uh, from a actually tackling a mainframe. If you think about it, that's the last compute. We've taken, you know, uh, apologize to my AWS colleagues, Windows servers, moving them over are great. Try PL1, Rex, Assembler, and COBOL on a Kix environment, Sysplex. That's a little bit more complex. But, you know, and we're gonna be tackling some of those, which is very interesting. You know, my journey to AWS, I've been here 18 months, but I was at uh, reInvent in November, and Andy Jassy had a picture of the DMS truck, and we've been asking our customers, you need to go to the cloud. And our customers are going, great, but I've got a Z15, a Z14, AS400, how am I going to do that? And that was really the, the genesis of where we're at today. You know, I started literally uh, from November to March of 2020, and then we announced our mainframe migration competency programs and, and all those things. So we've got a, a, a long, um, excuse me here while I figure this out here. There we go. So we're actually announcing a, a, a mainframe modernization service. Now, I've personally, my team has done over 200 mainframe migrations since the 90s. Very familiar. One of the interesting things when I was watching uh, Jonathan and Mary speak, you know, at its core, a migration is what do you have? Where does it go? I don't have it to work. I got third party. I mean, all of those things apply. So the recipe applies. What's different is that we're going to have the technology to help you actually move some of these things. And so one of the critical things uh, from actually moving a mainframe migration application is you have to analyze what you currently have today. So what do you have on your mainframe? What third party tools do you have? How is that set up? What are your SLAs? 
truly understand the dependencies. We saw that nice little map there of you know, dependencies between programs. How do we transform those? Be aware of integration patterns, right? If you're gonna start moving workloads down, how are they gonna integrate back to the mainframe? You can't, I can compete on AWS and an EC2 with the compute and IO. I cannot compete with the mainframe compute and IO going through the cloud. And so that's why you gotta look and make sure you have understanding of those dependency mappings and how that works. And if latency comes in, we have solutions like Outposts that we can put in close to your mainframe to help you uh, address some of those. But the mainframe modernization service that we announced is basically a service, a one-stop shop. You're gonna be able to provision analysis tools to uh, analyze your mainframe workloads. You're gonna be able to you know, test as you go on, a, on multiple patterns. We, we prescribe, right now, two patterns are gonna be uh, are announced, the replatform pattern and the refactor pattern. So you're gonna be able to provision you know, on, a, on an EC2 uh, COBOL JCL kicks. Uh, you can also provision uh, the refactor pattern where you can actually start transforming some of those things. We'll talk a little about that. Not every code that you have on the mainframe uh, falls in either pattern. There's, you know, modernization is a journey and there are gonna be multiple forks in the road. And unfortunately, when it comes to mainframe, both paths don't look <laughs> appealing. So you're gonna have to kind of figure out which ways to go. And we're gonna help you through that, through our partners and everything like that. So the five patterns that we currently have from a mainframe perspective is that if you look at the number one um, issue from a mainframe perspective is agility. If you're still doing waterfall TSO ISPF and your competitors specifically in the financial industries like the FinTechs so or those, they can actually get code releases within a week and you're still doing your biannual or quarterly releases, you don't have that agility. But you can actually do that by deploying in, in the develop, and you can actually have your Eclipse-based, visual uh, studio-based development for your mainframe workloads. That totally exists today. Turn off TSO ISPF. I mean, that, I, I always state, you know, no pain, no gain. That, you will hear people scream when you turn that off, but you gotta make that transition to make your mainframe agile, and we can help you with that on, on, on that. And you start doing DevOps and test automation, and you can start you know, moving workloads on down. The other pattern that we have from a mainframe modernization is a data augmentation pattern. Stay on the mainframe, stream data down, and consume your data there, you know, creating data lakes and things of that nature, uh, ML, uh, artificial AI, and those types of things, quick sight for, for reporting. That then turns into a, uh, from a data augmentation to a strangle pattern. Start rewriting, refactoring new features and functions that exist on, the, uh, on AWS and, and start working through that. The other pattern that we're seeing as well is the, uh, the what we're calling the replatform pattern, taking your existing mainframe workload onto an EC2, and we actually can, you know, we support COBOL and KIX and JCL, and you know, there's gonna be some gap analysis there. And there's some gives and takes, right? We actually prescribe uh, to our customers to do a, a rapid exit of what you currently have, warts and all, and then take the benefits of the cost savings that you currently have in that uh, platform. So you're able to, within EC2, we're seeing 60, 70% savings as compared to, to the uh, mainframe workloads. And from there, although you have warts and all, rethink your technical debt. You know, right now in the mainframe, you can only add more COBOL and so on, maybe surrounded, do API enable it. But once you're on an EC2, you have a lot of services available to you to actually start tackling your technical debt uh, for that and rethink the problem. Can I stream a kinesis? Can I have it consume over here? Can I create another features and functions for it? You know, and, and, and these are, well, the, the, from a COBOL perspective, these are proven technologies. I mean, it's, it's been, I used them in the 90s. It's for microfocus. It's gonna be pers you know, provided within uh, the EC2. The other pattern is the refactor pattern, right? In the refactor pattern, you're gonna actually be able to take those uh, tools and refactor. And I'll talk a little bit about the refactor versus the, the, the replatform. But also from, a, you know, if you look at all the things that we're doing, it's a one-stop shop from a uh, mainframe modernization uh, as a service where you can analyze, you can develop, deploy, 
it's a managed service like an RDS, right? Managing your mainframe workloads. You know, there's some fine print there. We've got to tackle PO1 and assembler, things of that nature. But if you think about Kix, COBOL, uh, you know, JCL, and then also how do we get that into uh, in, in refactoring as well? Th that, that's going to be the managed service and operating and maintaining. Think about, you know, if you have... I don't know if there's any mainframe folks, but like Omega Mon and things of that nature, six on the mainframe. So you buy these tools to analyze what your programs are doing if something app ends and the, all the dumps and all those kind. All of that stuff is available in the framework. You know, we've been monitoring workloads for years. So if you think about, you know, we're creating that uh, ability to actually tightly couple with these technologies to provide you all of those types of, uh, uh, of workloads. So the service itself right now is, you know, we're going to provide agility for our mainframes, if you want to just like what I call toe in the water, let's test out the cloud and start doing you know, DevOps uh, within, within that capability. It's on demand, you just provision it, connect it to your um, source code management system on the mainframe, download it, do your edits and tests. You know, and and we, got, you know, we got to do that assessment to figure out what's gonna work. You know, there's certain things that we can do and can't do. Uh, but you know, we do support from a, uh, a development standpoint, we could do a COBOL and assembler and, and, and things of that nature uh, for development for the mainframe. Now, it's, it's a managed service, so very few interfaces that you have to do. You can actually just deploy it. It's just like, you know, doing like an RDS environment. And we're leveraging proven patterns for the two offerings that we're doing around refactoring and, and replatforming. You know, we have, you know, uh, from a re platform perspective, the COBOL and the JCL is a partnership with MicroFocus. It's a proven t uh, tool chain that we've been using for a long time. And then we recently acquired Blue Edge, which is a refactor that's going to be part of this. So if your customers want to go to refactor or the rehost uh, capability, we're seeing uh, the services are going to be pretty high, but uh, going to go pretty well, uh, high up, but also quicker modernization. To me, having a one-stop shop for uh, what we're working on right now as far as, if you think about a mainframe migration has, you know, you have S, the global S size, and within the global S size, you go to a specialty shop to actually tackle some of these things. Being able to provision the software for you, being able to get the, you know, the transformation for you, all of these things, instead of trying to, you know, searching on the web, for, trying to figure out what, who, what vendor does a, a PO1 conversion, we're gonna have all of those answers for you ready to go within this group. And then the, it's a pay as you go, as you consume and move rec, workloads down. As you consume that, you pay as you go. You don't have to you know, procure a bunch of software and licenses or hire a bunch of folks. You go at your pace. You know? And you know, one of the interesting things that we, I see here at, at AWS is that we've done so many migrations. We've done so many. If you look at all the programs around it, is how to remove those blockers and all those lessons learned. You know, quite frankly, it came from the School of Hard Knocks. I mean, we, we went there and did it. My colleague, Jonathan Allen, has a doctorate from the School of Hard Knocks. And so, you know, if you think about, you know, these are, take advantage of all the bumps and <laughs> everything that we've done through this uh, process and, and, uh, and apply it to here. And, and, and that's one of the things that we're seeing uh, that I'm very excited about as, as we're bringing these things on. So let's talk about some of the refactoring uh, challenges from specifically from a mainframe perspective. We're going to talk a little bit about different things. You know, to me, the seven R's really apply. It's not either or or one, but customers are different. There's customers that want to take everything to Java. We'll, we'll help you to do that. There's customers that are okay staying in COBOL. And we got, to me, the most important R from a mainframe is the retire. Eliminate as much stuff that you have on that mainframe and bring that down and just get rid of it. That, that to me is the most important that I was at a bank, I have a currency trading system, Mary has one, John has one, somebody else has one because they had currency tradings that were acquired. Currency trading is currency trading. And so, you know, we just take, pick one and sunset the rest. And so, you know, that takes, you know, <laughs> the business will always fight you, but these types of application portfolio managements are things that you have to do to kind of work through that. All right, so with, with that, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of finishing up right here right now. And then uh, give us a call if you want to do the, the assessment components, and then we can kind of kick, start, kick starting some of these things up right now. All right. We could let Steve talk forever. 
You, you wind me up. That's it. <laughs> His favorite topic. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. I'm going to take us to the home stretch here. Uh, if I click, there we go. Uh, we talked a bit about refactor. Uh, I'll go quickly through this. We've launched a new feature, uh, migration uh, hub refactor spaces. Gives you two options, as Steve talked about, the launch a new feature or do the strangler fig method. Uh, there again, this works also for your monolith x86 app, so it's not limited to just your mainframe, but it's also available today. Um, it gives you choice. You can decide what you do with those monoliths. It's not a one-size-fits-all, so you can pick and choose what you want to do. Um, I'm not going to take you through the technical architecture of this. Uh, I'll build this up quickly, but it just helps you with redirecting the traffic to what's going to the monolith, what's going to the new code that you've now built. And I'll quickly get to the slide that tells you about the sessions. There are more sessions on that. I think some of my colleagues might be available afterwards to answer questions, but we do have sessions around the Migration Hub Refactor Spaces um, that we can definitely tell you more about, and there's some workshops as well. So lastly, I want to leave you with Retain. You know, you do have some workloads that you just have to move. You just have a choice. It just, it's got to go somewhere. Uh, and so you have choices, whether it be a colo, managed service provider, but it is an R that sometimes we just have to do. There's just workloads you can't do without. Lastly, I'm going to leave with this. Use all the strategies. Use Steve's, everything we've talked about. You need to use them all. They're all part of your toolkit for a successful migration. Wave planning, it's going to be continual. It's going to be prioritized. It's going to be a mix of all those R's. There again, it's all important to help you get to that final result, whatever your compelling event is. One of our customers, Sky Canner, Scanner, uh, has used our MAP program to really accelerate their migration. So there again, being able to, what took them you know, six or seven weeks to launch a service can now do in 15 minutes. So there again, the agility you get from getting to the cloud is just, you know, it's just huge to be able to measure. We talked about partners. This slide will be available to you. Uh, take a picture if you like. It is all the various partners and tools that you will see by each phase. So this is really helpful. Many of these uh, partners are in the expo. So if you're interested in some phase of the migration, their tool, they're available to chat more about what their capability can do. You can always get a cool sticker. Um, as we talked about, rehost, optimize. You know, if you see this, right? The, the unit cost goes down based upon what you do to the app. But if you can start with the rehost, optimize, that gets you started. And then you continue to optimize and reduce costs as you go. So it's really an important thing to remember that optimize phase. I'm going to leave you with a quote that we always do. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. Sometimes people spend way too much time in portfolio assessment and wave planning, months and months and months, instead of just get started. Once you get started, you will know more, you'll know how your organization works, and how can you get your workloads moved in the way you want to at the speed you want to. With that, I thank you, and please fill in the survey for us. Uh, we'll be available up here if you have any questions. Thank you.